Okay, so here's a project that uh, I'm working on with uh, Eric Dollard. Uh, these are two uh, Air Force 19 inch racks that I got from a neighbor across the street. Uh, when he passed several years uh, back, I purchased his whole uh, electronic collection. Uh, that was uh, Robert Sewell. He was in charge of all the uh, Washington Water Power Underground um, electrical facilities. And uh, these have been sitting in my shop for a while and finally got them taken out. We're making some bases for them. And, um, these two racks are going to have different purposes. This rack is going to have all the audio uh, components and this is going to have all the RF. And these are going to be able to get mixed together uh, to be put into a Tesla coil and it's basically the cosmic induction generator system that everybody's been looking for. Uh, but that's actually not the original purpose that the audio side of this was uh, uh, engineered by Eric for. Uh, about five years ago, we started talking about different systems that could potentially um, split water with no energy, meaning electrostatically pulling water apart. And there's a few people who have uh, patents on that method, like Tehi Han, uh, putting them in between two barium titanate plates, bringing a voltage to about 40,000 volts, and that's supposed to electrically pull the water molecule apart without running current through it, so it's not electrolysis. And this essentially, I guess you could consider it a, and this is not complete right now. We have the scope, we kind of have the high voltage audio amp. There's a few other components that will be here. This is a high voltage uh, rectifier. And uh, there'll be a few, few more pieces. And then inside here we have a big uh, RCA AM transmitter, um, uh, transmitter or a, a transformer, probably weighs about 120, 130 pounds. And this side was in, uh, originally intended to be, I guess you could see a complex waveform generator, but a high power, uh, really high voltage, where you can start with a uh, signal generator, putting out like a sine wave or square wave, whatever waveform you want, and that will be amplified by a 30 watt uh, amplifier, which will be in one of these sections here, and then that feeds into this uh, unit right here with two uh, 810 tubes and uh, when this is coupled properly with the high voltage rectifier that goes to the high fidelity output transformer and so essentially it'd be a very uh, high power probably as close to distortion free as you can get military spec audio modulator unit and the output of that can go to plates to experiment with that so that's all still uh, theoretical ha has not been proven and the more Eric thought about it he wanted to create the system so it'd be more universal for a lot of different uh, types of experiments, that would be one of many. When you couple it with the RF section and you can have a RF modulated Tesla coil with whatever audio you put in here, this can also be used to light up all the interesting plasma formations that you've seen in some of the photographs uh, from you know 20, 30 years ago uh, that Eric had built in uh, what, Colinas, Colinas, California, yeah. California and he's done these demonstrations in uh, Santa Barbara, California. There's no video evidence of it because nobody knows where any of the videos are, but everybody saw it where at last year's conference for 2019 Energy Science and Technology Conference, um, Eric had engineered a 20 to 1 scale model replica of the Colorado Springs Tesla uh, magnifying transformer and one of the many experiments that were done was to create a uh, little flame speaker, the, the flame shooting off the top of one of the uh, uh, elevated capacitors on the receiver uh, receiving coil was uh, maybe an inch and a half and it was playing uh, some music coming from a local radio station tuned to that same frequency uh, on the AM band, probably 850 or something like that AM, uh, somewhere around there and it just sounds like very high fidelity sound that's like coming out of space. It doesn't sound directional like it's coming right out of a speaker so that was kind of an interesting experience but that flame speaker being so small and not very powerful, that sound was uh, very strong throughout the entire uh, room, uh, presentation room. So now we're going to transmit on the AM band, we're going to transmit some music, but there's a discharge point up there which is going to cause a flame, and you'll actually hear the music coming out of it. <laughs> and being that these are connected together out of phase, uh, we've pretty much eliminated this possibility to transmit, so we're not violating any FCC regulations. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? <laughs> so, everybody listening, quiet. Silence. Quiet. There's 
no videotaping here. Uh, this one is going to be quite a bit bigger, maybe, I don't know, a foot, foot and a half long, or, you know, we, we don't know yet yeah. until we start doing the experiments. About six inches. Uh, at least about six yeah. inches, um, which means it's going to be more than three times the sound. It's, it's going to be, uh, you know, uh, I guess you could say, uh, it's going to be a lot more powerful. Uh, so we're going to be able to do the flame speaker. Um, there's one video by Borderlands years ago that was called Free Energy Research. And inside of that video, there was like a compilation of a bunch of different demonstrations, uh, maybe 10, 15 different demonstrations. And one of them, Eric has a Bach playing through a little flame speaker where he's burning these fractal patterns on a, uh, a piece, of, piece of wood. This is going to do something like that. And uh, the goal is to have all this done for next year's conference. This will be one of the main demonstrations. And we'll do as many de demonstrations with these two racks uh, combined. Uh, that we can that that you know whatever we're, we're going to be able to do that's possible with the equipment that we have, and uh, so that's kind of what we're working on. Um, we've supported a couple people in trying to put together a cosmic induction generator to replicate what Eric did in the past. Uh, so that hasn't happened. So I have to get involved and basically uh, do it myself with Eric and whoever is helping to uh, fabricate some of these uh, pieces. Uh, these are all pretty much built from scratch. Um, a lot of eBay parts. Uh, this panel was built from uh, met flat metal that we had to have bent and everything. And then I found out that you can actually buy these panels, but you can't buy a panel where it's bent like this. Um, so I'll t uh, Eric will give an explanation and we'll give a little tour of the, the different components that are involved here. What the rectifier panel looks like on the other side. What this 810 uh, uh, tube unit looks like in the back and uh, underneath. We left the panel off so you can kind of see the wiring. We've been working on this for about two weeks straight now, uh, just doing the wiring and mostly finishing this. Now that this has been completed, it took us maybe a couple days to wire up the, the rectifier panel. And what we're working on right now are um, some strips that will go down the side to carry all the wires and to be able to hook everything up and we have to uh, connect the ground system. And so, do you want to explain anything right now as we have the... Well, I can go through the lineup so because a lot of things are missing. So. This is the power amplifier, or the output amplifier, that uses the 810 tubes. You might want to grab an 810 tube later, we can see it. Okay, let's, uh, let me get you in there better. Okay, I'll grab a tube. Drop these. bench. So this is the 810 triode, was the mainstay in a lot of small broadcast transmitters. There must have been millions of them made in the late 30s into the early 50s. It's basically the uh, purpose of this tube usually is a high power audio source, so this thing will produce 1,000 watts of audio power and at the same time put that at 2400 volts AC, which with another set of transformers or a network can be stepped up to about 100,000 volts. So this thing can produce some rather serious outputs as far as voltage and power goes, and because it's high fidelity, any type of complicated waveform can be put through this, so the harmonics can be all be manipulated, 
transport can also be used as a uh, ULF or VLF transmitter. An Alexanderson antenna can be used as a power supply for what we call the Trump motor. It's a high-speed electrostatic motor developed by Donald Trump's uncle. So, in general, it's conceived as a universal uh, high-fidelity audio frequency power source to produce any particular waveform that you want at machine power levels. So, put the tube away. So then we have the oscilloscope for monitoring the output waveform. Uh, the next thing down here is a seven inch panel and that has to be all fabricated from scratch like this one was so it's still in the primordial stage. That's the uh, control grid amplifier that drives the grids and regulates their power into this stage and then your signal source plugs into that which connects to your microphone amplifier or your audio oscillator or what have you, so there'll be a matching Hewlett Packard 200 style audio oscillator that will go here to generate the pitch for sine wave use and then a regular Western Electric patch panel in here for juggling the audio around. This provides the DC power to the 810 triodes. It's uh, 2400 watts, one kilowatt DC out from uh, 115 volts AC in this panel here is under construction. That will be the dummy load consisting of 27 and a half watt, 120 volt incandescent lamps. This so, will go behind yeah, this that, panel. Yeah, that will be right in there. In so, because you never want to operate any large transformer device unloaded when you're doing tests, or it could destroy the insulation and the windings. And then this is a blank access panel. So that's the lineup. Now in here, it'll be similar. This will be the output tuning unit, and then there will be a radio frequency power amplifier, which will look very similar. That will use iMac 4-250 tetrodes. Tetrodes make things a lot more complicated circuit-wise, but they're a lot more stable. It will be designed to put out 2,000 watts. Then its grid control uh, system here will just be DC. It'll just be the screen voltage and the bias voltage, and then in the lower part here will be a Collins 32V 100 watt uh, HF transmitter that will be the exciter for the 4-250s, and then the rectifiers, which will be twice the power, be 4,800 volts at uh, at about a half amp, close to maybe one in peaks, and that will all go down here. So this is all in the parts phase right now. Maybe actually might want to show the parts lineup of all these rare okay. things we're getting a little later. Okay. Well, let me, let me just go on a little further. So, so out of this will we'll go, there will be a table that will hold a specially designed set of coils that will duplicate the Tesla transformer that I first developed in Bolinas, actually all the way back in high school to start experimenting with this stuff and it works so well at the Marconi powerhouse in Bolinas and I know that it works, that's the coil form we're going to use. It's going to look a little different than the ones that I've normally designed because this is a spark generator and not a uh, so much a communications or induction device as something that's more of a theatrical device in this case. And um, so then once this is developed this will be operating at a frequency of about 3,300 kilocycles, somewhere around there. Then I have a 5,000 watt completely constructed AM broadcast transmitter in the, um, the shop in Tonopah in Nevada. And uh, then the whole thing will be scaled up five times. And then at that point, the, uh, it's anyone's guess as to how stunning the output's going to be. So this is kind of the first stage, and then once the geometry is established, then uh, then we go up to the big one with the pre-made transmitter. The two 5,000 watt ones. Yeah, the 5,000 watt transmitter. Yeah. yeah, so once everybody sees this, and if you want to see uh, the big large scale, then uh, as many donations as possible. To... Well, that's, uh, that's something that needs to be pointed out here. This stuff's very expensive. Mm -hmm. And uh, anybody, most people you try to work with on this, they just go, the details and the cost makes them insane, and they go nuts on you, and everything disappears to the dump. So I stopped going that route. 
But at any rate, it looks like this time we're going to stick with it. Uh, I, don't, I don't think anyone can really understand how much work's involved in putting this stuff together because there's no diagram. I have to do all this out of my head. And, uh, and that's quite a workload. And the parts are very difficult to find. Some of them are very expensive. And uh, this is not a project for the amateur. This is the real thing. So it's, people have been waiting for a long time to see it. So this will be the first time that it will be generally viewed since I had put this thing together back in uh, 1978 in Bolinas. I had to build everything all over again out at the RCA station. And this is only the second tube unit I've ever built. <laughs> yeah. You know, jumping straight into something like this was, uh, was a challenge just to find the parts to begin with. Yeah, and then the time to put it together. I mean, just the hardware alone. How many screws do you think this thing's eaten up so far? Hundreds. Yeah, if not thousands. <laughs> yeah. And we're not done. Not done. You can see by all the empty space. Okay, so here's some of the parts over here. Do you want to walk through any of these? On well, maybe you can just kind of show it. So a lot of these boxes are closed up. Four 250As. These, yeah. these are tubes, some lamps. Modulation choke. Make Tesla cap. Modulation capacitor and then all the meters, all the matching meters. This is so we can mount the uh, RF rack to the base. There's a few more parts over here that, that came in. So this is this is flipped around. This will be 180 degrees flipped around that way. So the flat side is here. And then there's little channels that uh, the high voltage cables and all this kind of stuff goes through. So this is the scope right here. This is the inside of the. Uh, well, I can just put. I'll put this on the yeah. bench over there. We'll walk through it. This is the high voltage uh, rectifier panel. This was the easiest one to do, but it was a tough, toughest uh, panel. Pretty thick metal just have this built or bent over uh, but it started as a flat sheet so the 120 goes in here potential transformer output here's a bridge turn it into DC then this transformer was hard to find 15,000 ohm primary 5,030 ohm secondary this is RCA uh, modulation transformer out of some uh, AM transmitter. Literally weighs about 120, maybe 130 pounds. And this will be part of the ground system here. So I'll pull uh, this unit out, set it on the bench, and Eric will give a walkthrough on uh, what this is. But uh, obviously this is all hand-built and custom-made. I put quite a few hours into this and so did Eric with the engineering and the wiring. We'll walk you through all this. Okay. You want me to describe the front panel? Yeah. So we have the power control switches and the fuses and then um, there's two voltages. The voltmeter, there's two voltages that have to be adjusted. The grid bias voltage which has got to be set at about 60 and the filament voltage here which has to be set at 5 actually it's 10 for the tubes but I had to use the center tap because we only can find an 8 volt meter and obviously we found a smaller size so it's hard to get things to match up this one also measures the uh, plate voltage which in this case is 0 to 3000 so it'll be operating between 2400 and 2800 and this is the current going into the plates of the tubes. This is simply a meter 
voltage voltmeter select switch in either the high voltage or the bias and that's pretty much it from the front basically not a lot going on just on off and adjustments of voltage then there's always a window with these big tubes to see on the inside because the plates run luminous they're either red to orange hot and uh, you got to make sure you don't get them too hot so typically you have a window to view the anodes of the tubes this frame to turn it into a box. I'll flip this on the handles so we can see, uh, have some light on the inside. You can see it better. And we'll go over the what's underneath. So this is the tubes, of course. You want to put it on its handles? or? Yeah, yeah, if you can get it in there. Okay. So this is the high voltage in and out. And then the filament transformer for the big tubes. Then these are the parasitic suppressors for the plates of the tubes. Basically a small inductance and then some non-inductive resistances at its terminations to prevent any high frequency transients from get going. And then this is the bias transformer that generates the negative 60 volts for the grid to keep the plate current at a proper level. And this is the grid input transformer, which is basically a hi-fi audio output transformer connected backwards. And then this is the grid parasitic suppressor resistors to prevent any transients or high frequency oscillations from getting going. And then of course the backs of the meters and, and what have you. And there's that relay behind the... Yeah, that's the safety relay so that in case the power tubes lose bias, they don't start hogging plate current and incinerate themselves. If the bias is lost, that relay opens circuits and then shuts off the high voltage, so it's automatic protection. Plus it gives a little time delay in starting, too. Then these are the input-output connections. Power in, and then various test voltages and currents out, or in, and the actual audio input. Okay. So we got a good angle on that. Okay, so this is the bottom. It's the backs of the switches, lights and fuses, backs of the uh, terminals. This is the uh, bias rectifier and then its load, capacitor and resistor. Finalize the conversion to DC. This is the uh, high voltage voltmeter multiplier resistor so that at 2400 volt, uh, 3000 volts, one milliamp flows through the panel meter, which is calibrated zero to three, then gives 3000 volt full scale reading. Of course, this has to be heavily insulated. And then we have the, uh, this is where the AC power gets connected to various relay contacts and potentiometers and transformer coils. So this is the 120 volts. This is the um, part of the bias circuitry, the relay control. So this is more control stuff here. That's the bottom of the relay. This is where all the panel meters connect to whatever they go to in the circuit here. And then this selects the uh, impedance taps on the audio frequency input transformer for the different line impedances and output voltages and what have you to optimize to whatever piece of equipment is going to be driving it. And that's pretty much it. It's pretty basic, but uh, when you start putting it together, it doesn't look so basic. That's a lot of work. A lot of figuring of where everything's going to go. Use Teflon wire. I learned that. <laughs> yeah, this is all military-style construction. You're not going to find this in your normal audio amplifier. Wire's all Teflon. It adheres to the proper color coding the best we could because a lot of this stuff's no longer available with digital so you can't get the wires with the stripes anymore and so I had to use a lot of white wires for the wires that we didn't have so there's too many white wire circuits in here but uh, this it's hard 
basically in another five years it won't be possible to do any of this anymore because of digital. This stuff will all disappear.